Good morning and welcome everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful and blessed week. Now, let us delve into the school of the spirit where we educate your spirit man and bring the word of God in a different and more dynamic light. And as you listen, may you be blessed. Your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Romans chapter 12 verse 11. The scripture says, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Uh, NIV says, okay, James Version says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. So the key word there is, we want to look at is fervent in the spirit, being enthusiastic, being, another word for it is aglow, being aglow in the spirit, serving God. Another word is being zealous. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says, being zealous unto every good work. God wants us to be on fire. Your zeal, your passion will continue to build every day. No slothful, not being lukewarm. So we're going to be looking at how can we Remain on fire for God from the beginning to the end. What are those things that we need to do in order to be aglow, in order to be zealous and continue to be zealous for the things of God? God requires that in serving him, you don't serve him with a half-heartedness. You don't serve God You don't serve God cold food or cold meal. You serve it hot. God wants you to be on fire for him. God doesn't want a dull moment in your life in the service of God. God wants you to be that your love, which that is the first love you had for him when you first met Christ. John calls it in Revelation, first love. When you first met Christ, when you fell in love with him, <clears throat> when you first got born again, remember how your heart burns for Jesus Christ. How that you wish that every day let there be church service. Just like David said in Psalm 122, when they say to me, let us go to the house of God, he said he was glad. He was excited. Always excited about God, about everything that has to do with God. So when people come around you, it is that excitement, it is that vibe. that moves them to begin to ask what is it that is in you that is making you this way, look this way. That's why the Bible says, so that when they ask you what is the hope, <clears throat> what is the reason for all this thing that you are doing? What is the reason for all this, your excitement and all this, your passion? You'll be able to say, it, this is it. So for them to ask that question means that something unusual, there is something unusual about you, about your Christian faith. Many of us, when we come in contact with other people, even your fellow Christians and all of that, nobody will know whether there is anything about God or Christianity and all of that with you, except somebody is forced to ask. 
find it for me when they say, what is the hope that is in you? In the book of Peter, I think it's First Peter. Hope that is in you. Okay, so he said, but sanctify the Lord in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. No, nobody, will ask, well, nobody will come to you and ask you what is the reason for the hope that is in you, if not because of what they are seeing you do or the kind of expression or the kind of passion with which you do what you do, or even when you talk about Jesus Christ or when you talk about the gospel, the passion with which you say it. You don't have to shout it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't have to shout. You can even be saying it gently and quietly. But the, the spirit that is, the, the, the fire that comes from you, the passion, the zeal, the commitment towards it. So that's what God said. I, I want you not to be slothful in business, not to be lazy, not to be lukewarm. And you see, anything that you offer to God with lukewarmness, anything that you offer to God with, uh, with uh, an indifferent attitude, God doesn't receive it. That's why the Bible said that God loves a cheerful giver. If whatever service you are rendering to God must be cheerful. So if your service to God is, uh, is dry, is, um, you know, you are just managing or struggling and all, no, God won't receive such service from you. So that is why he said, not being slothful in business, but uh, fervent in the spirit. Being on fire in the spirit, serving God. A lot of us serve God when it is convenient and when it is. Up. Paul was telling Timothy, he said, serve him, preach the gospel in season and out of season. When you are passionate about it, when you think you are passionate about it and when you think you are not passionate about it, go ahead and preach. So it is all way. The reason is, is because you have received the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that is inside of you is the one that quickens you. The Bible calls it the joy of thy salvation. You must not lose it. A lot of, a lot of us have lost that joy. It's not that the joy is not there. It's been quenched. God wants you to be joyful, making a joyful noise, making, being joyful about God. Even in the time of adversity and all of that, God does not expect you to be downcast. So the, what we're going to discuss this morning is how can we ensure that we are on fire for God? And uh, our discussion today is going to be the other way around. So I'm going to be asking you, you're going to say, give us ways you think or a way you think that we need to be on fire for God. Okay. It's going to be that way. So you raise it, we discuss it. Yes. How can we, what and what do we need to do in order to be on fire for God? To continue to remain on fire for God, for Jesus. Yes. Yes. Scripture. Okay, okay. So what you are saying now is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 25. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, 
as the manner of some is. Have you seen it? As the manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much as, uh, so much the more as you see the day approaching. So one of the conditions to make sure that you are on fire for God is by what? Maintaining fellowship with the brethren always. Why do we need to maintain fellowship? That is why when you see somebody that is backsliding and all of that, what you, you notice is that first of all, that backsliding starts with uh, not praying, not doing his devotion and all of that. Then the next thing you are going to see is a withdrawal from attendance. He will start withdrawing from fellowshipping with the brethren. You won't see the person in church for one week, for two weeks. Once in a while you see him show up. After some time you won't see him again. It's not that there is any other place that he has gone to. On a Sunday service, on a Sunday morning, on a midweek service, on a prayer meeting and all of that, that general meeting that the church has, you will see him there. And it's not that there is any other thing important that he's doing, but he's there in the house, or maybe he has gone to work or do some other things apart from being in the presence of God. So when you begin to notice that is a sign that that person is not, you can't be on fire for God and not be in the presence of God. That is why David said, when they said to me, let us go to the house of God, I was so glad, I was excited. That excitement, because why do you need to be in the presence of God or fellowshipping with the brethren? Because the Bible says, they that appear in Zion do what? They grow from strength to strength. You are being strengthened. Your spiritual strength is a being built. You encourage one another. And that is what he said in that Hebrew chapter 20, uh, 10, 25. So when we come together, Hebrew 10, 25, he said, not forsaking the assembling of, the, of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. So when we gather, when we gather together in, in fellowship, we encourage one another, we see one another, we talk to one another, we bear one another's burden and all of that. Because you can't just be out there in your house or somewhere else and then you are talking about uh, having an issue or challenges and all of that. You have to be in the presence of God with the brethren. That's where the job, there are so many benefits of being in the presence of God, a lot of them. In Psalm 133, the Bible tells us how it is that it, when brethren, 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 not brother, brethren, when brethren dwell together in unity, there are so many blessings that God has put in place. So you find out that the, that is where the presence of God is. That's where you meet with God. That is where you do. We are not talking about, you know, any other thing, but when we come in the presence of God, because the Bible said that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in the army. So the presence of God is there. He said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Just like we are this morning. And then he began to tell us what happens in verse 2. He said, it is like the oil upon the head. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And that went down to the skirts of his garments. And verse 3 says, as the dew of Hammon, as the dew that descended upon the Mount Zion, upon mountains of Zion, for there the Lord does what? Commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. These are the things that happen when we gather together in the presence of God. So there is nothing like being downcast. There is nothing like mourning in the presence of God. He will give you the oil of uh, joy in place of the spirit of what? Mourning or heaviness and all of that. So you see the refreshing that comes when we meet with God. Something is happening to you. Something is going on in your spiritual life. But you may not see it with your eyes. 
Okay, so that is um, one way we maintain our fire. Give me Psalm 84, verse 7. Okay, so he said, they go from strength to strength. You continue to grow. You, you, you continue to develop. The more you appear before God with an open heart, the more you appear before God, as long as you keep doing that, you are growing. In the knowledge of God, you are being strengthened, you are being equipped. It's just like a student who doesn't go to classes. And then the one that goes to classes, every time he doesn't miss one class. From the beginning of the time to the end. It's most likely that that, that, that person is going to so, uh, um, uh, pass that class. And even if you don't pass, if the lecturers or the school needs to have mercy on you, they are going to look at your attendance. And as a matter of fact, these days, there is a score for being in attendance in the class. The reason being that as long as you are in the class, then you are looking at, you are hearing what the teacher is saying, and you are being taught and all of that. Something is happening to you. There is a level of knowledge you are gaining. There is a level of discipline that you are undergoing and all of that. So the same thing applies when we come to church. And God had designed, made it, is supposed to be a compulsory thing. The best place to be at any time, T, is in the presence of God. The best, time, the best place to be on planet Earth, in this whole world that God created, the best place to be is in the presence of God. No other place. So as much as possible, make sure you don't ever deny yourself being in... Being in the presence of nothing should take the place of it because that is one way you keep growing and getting strengthened. Okay, so what is the next one? Another, okay. In other words, what you are saying here is setting your heart on eternity. Uh, tuning your heart to eternity. If your heart is set on that, that's just the, why the, the, Jesus, uh, the Bible is saying that Second Chronicle chapter 69. He said that the eyes of the Lord is searching to and fro all the earth looking for those whose hearts have stayed on him. Have you seen it? And then the Bible says he will do what? Make himself strong on their behalf. That is another way you make sure that your heart is on fire for God, that your life is on fire for God. If you are spiritually minded, that's another word, I'll be spiritually minded, Looking up for the eternal values, eternal rewards. To be spiritually minded is what? Is life and peace. You can't have life and peace without being on fire for God. And because that is what it means to be on fire. You are, you are full of life and you are peaceful. That's the grace of God. Is Somebody sees you, he sees God's grace upon your life. The reason is because you set your heart on the things that are from above. You are connected. You are, every time you are thinking about heaven, you are thinking about spiritual, the eternal thing, things that has eternal value. And because you are thinking, because you are what you think, as man thinketh in his heart, so he is. 
So it is what, if you begin to think about eternity, you think about eternity all the time. If the next thing is that you're going to begin to move towards it. Your actions, your decisions, your values, everything that you do is going to reflect that. But if you are thinking about everything that is under the sun, if you are thinking about this side of life and all of that, you're also going to be moved towards that. Everything about you is about gain and loss. It's about your stomach. It's about to take care of your, your needs and all of that. That's where your mind and everything stays. And the Bible tells us if only in this life you have hope, you're going to have a miserable life. Because the things that happen to these people out there is going to begin to happen to you. The grace of God will be lifted from you. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in him. Because if your mind is stayed on God, you are concentrating on God, you are thinking, it means that's where your heart is. Where your heart is is where your treasure is. Of course, you know Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. He said, if you, be, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. So you think about heaven, think about eternity, think about the reward, think about, about these other men like Abraham and all of that. What is it that is, uh, what, what, made them, what made Abraham and, and, and the rest leave? The Bible said that they, they left Egypt and then they, they never considered going back again. They were looking forward for a city whose builder and maker is God and not man. And so they were able to afford, they, can, they were able to dwell in tents. So they call all those things that are of this world of no consequence. He said because they were looking for a city. If they were mindful of where they, will, they came from, they would have returned. So their mind were set on the things of eternity. Eternal values. And that is what we're supposed to be like. That's how our heart will be. That's how, so once your, once your heart is geared towards that, you can be rest assured. You continue, the grace of God will continue to flow. The peace of God is going to continue to flow. The Bible says, if you are spiritually minded, life and peace. But to be carnally minded is what? Death. Okay. So that is, um, how many have we looked at now? Two. Yes, do we have another one? I have some here, but so what you are saying is, in, yeah, okay. Psalm 143, 11, what does it say? Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. So what do you want to pull out from there? For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Have you seen that? Another way you remain on fire for God is through your prayer life. You maintain a prayer life. And see, eh, if you set your heart on things from above, if you maintain fellowship with the brethren and you set your, things, your heart on things from above, your prayer life, you will struggle with prayer. You will struggle with prayer when you are carnally minded, when you're always thinking about this side of life. When you don't come to church, you are not being built. Praying will become a very difficult thing to you. Quicken me, O oh Lord, that's a prayer. In other words, revive me, O oh God. The more, the Bible says, as we behold him with an open face, as in a mirror, we are being changed. But you see, what will make you improve or have a prayer life is because 
your heart is always set on the things that are from above. Prayer becomes like the air you breathe. Prayer becomes instantaneous. But when your mind and your attention is always about what to eat and what to drink, about business to do and all of as long as you concentrate on this side of life, you will have a very big problem praying. Prayer will be a very big problem to you. But as long as you set your heart on, you are thinking about heaven and God and all of that, the spirit flows. It becomes easy for you to pray. And as a matter of fact, you can stay in the place of prayer. The spirit of God takes control. Because he says if your heart stays on God, he will make himself strong on your behalf. He is the one that is at work in you, both to will and to do his pleasure. That scripture will be fulfilled in your life. God quickens you to pray. He helps you to pray. So, but in absence of this, you don't go to church, you don't find yourself in church always and all of that. You come to church once in a while. And then why you come to church once in a while is because even on a Sunday morning, you are somewhere talking. You are somewhere, um, they, they invited you to come and speak somewhere. Not in the church setting and all of that. One function or the other. On a Sunday service, you can't be on fire for God. It is impossible. If you're on fire for God, you won't do it. It's just like inviting me, telling me that there is one meeting they are doing in the village. Or maybe my village people in Lagos here, yeah, they are doing the whatever. Then on a Sunday morning that I should be, that I, I have to give them, give an opening speech on a Sunday morning and, and then I will leave this place and I will go there. So, <clears throat> we're talking about the things that help you to pray. Because prayer is part of the thing that will make you to be on fire for God. So what will help your prayer life is that your heart is always set on it. You are thinking about heaven, you are thinking about God, you are thinking about church, you are thinking about eternity. As a man thinketh in his heart, so you become. Then prayer becomes very easy for you. It becomes a way of life. No struggles. You, that is when the Holy Spirit is releasing. Sir. The Holy Spirit is free to move and walk in you. Okay, so the next one. How many have we discussed? Three. Okay. Okay. When you study the Word of God, how does it keep you on fire? How does studying the Word of God keep you on fire? When you study the word of God, when you study the word, the Bible says the word of God is quick. The word of God is powerful. The word of God, is, Jesus said, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life inside. As you behold him with an open face, as in a mirror. The mirror is the word of God, the Bible. As you behold him, there is an encounter. So you encounter God. There are two ways you encounter God. You encounter God by the power of his spirit. You encounter God also through his word. So as you study the word of God, as you read the Bible... Even the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, he said there is a blessing that comes from reading the Bible alone. Just reading it alone. Find it for me, please. Revelation. Revelation. Yeah, 112. Let's look at 112. Is it 112, 110, 112? He said, blessed is he that does what? that read it, and they that hear the word of this prophecy, the word of prophecy. The word of prophecy talks about the word of God, the word that is inspired by God. Reading the Bible alone, you are blessed. 
Of course, you know, it is reading it with an open face, not with a veiled face. If you read the Bible with a veiled face, the blessing will not come. What does it mean to read the Bible with a veiled face? You can read it without a veil over your face. Second three, uh, Corinthians three eighteen tells us, as we behold him with an open face, not with a veil. Give it to me. Verse sixteen. Nevertheless, when he shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Veil. There is a veil when you turn to the Lord. Verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Verse 18. But we all, you see, all of us, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even, by, even as by the spirit of the Lord. If you are reading the Bible with a veiled face, you won't have anything. It will be dry. But when you remove the veil and you want to read it, life comes. If you look at the Old Testament saints in the Jewy, the Jews, when they want to read the Torah, what do they do? The Torah is a Bible. That is the first five books of the Bible. When they want to read it, what do they do? They first of all, two of us, they first of all do those ablutions. They wash their hands, wash their legs, wash their whatever, before they handle the word of the Bible, the Torah. What does this mean? That is why you read it with an open face. What does it mean to read with an open face? First Peter chapter 2. Verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside what? All malice and all guile and what? Hypocrisies and what? Envies and what? All evil speakings. Verse 2. As newborn babes, do what? Desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. If you don't do this, if you don't take away all guiles, all evil speakings, because he say you are the one that should do it, not God. Allow it, let it go. Then you can read the Bible. If you are keeping malice and bearing grudges and all of that, you carry the Bible, you will not see anything inside. It will be dry, empty. And that is why people's lives are not being changed. You can't be on fire for God. James chapter 1, 23, 21 tells us the same thing. In James 1, he said, Wherefore, lay apart what? All filthiness and superfluity of nothingness, and what do what again? Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, engrafted word which is able to do what? Save your soul. If you have a veil over your heart, that's what it means to have a veil. Is that clear now? Okay, so what other thing do we need? Okay. First Corinthians 14, verse 4. Okay. Talking about speaking in tongues. Yeah, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, he defieth himself. When you pray in the spirit, when you pray in the spirit, but you see, there are so many people that pray in the spirit and they are so dry. True or false? True or false? So why? Why? It's the same thing. Psalm 68 verse 6 says, If I regard iniquity 
in my heart is that same veil. God will not hear your prayer. Because he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God in the spirit, he uttereth mystery. Those things, you can't connect. Your heart cannot be defiled and you, can't, you, you say you are connected. Because he's, a whole, you are, he's spirit to spirit. If the heart is defiled, it can't make that connection. Okay? All right. Psalm 119, verse 25. Psalm 119, 25. Okay. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy words. You see how the word quickens. The word of God quickens. He said, quicken thou me according to thy word. Quicken. The word quickens. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through the dividing and so It quickens. The quickening. To quicken means to, to bring back to life. To revive. That's what the word of God does. But they have to do it making sure that you don't have any veil before you. Okay? All right. Matthew. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 18, that is where he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And yes, go ye therefore into the world and preach the... Therefore, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you till the end of the age, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, how always, how often, always, even till when? Unto the end of the world. If Jesus Christ is with you, if he be with you, who can be against you? The presence of God goes with you. That is the ultimate of what you are looking for. That is the ultimate what you are clamoring for. To be, for the presence of God to be with you. So what you are saying here in essence is that same Romans chapter 12, verse 11, which we started with, where he says, do not be slothful in business, okay? But being fervent in the spirit, doing what? Serving God. So service to God, you must serve God. You must engage in service. If you are not in the service of God, there's no way you can be on fire for God because the evidence of your being on fire for God is that you are doing what? You are serving. Anybody that say that he is on fire there, whenever you talk about revival, when revival breaks out, that's when you see the preaching of the gospel will, exp will spread everywhere, just like in the Acts of Apostles. The preaching, people come alive again. The very first thing that you notice about revival is that purity and holiness become the order of the day. Righteousness comes alive again. And then the next thing you begin to see people going about, they are preaching the gospel. They are sharing their faith with anybody that they come in contact with and all of that. So you cannot be on fire for God without serving God. So service to God is of essence. If you read Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, um, verse 41. Matthew 24, 42. Matthew 24, 42. Which, watch therefore, for you know not where, which, what hour your Lord doth do what come. Verse 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch, the thief will come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be what? Broken. 44. Therefore, be ye also what? Ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son 
of man cometh. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? What does it mean to be faithful? Consistent. Steadfast. Something that is committed into your hand in that whatever. It doesn't go down. It doesn't dry up. You continue every time that thing is gaining value, is increasing, is multiplying. They put something in your hand, it doesn't die. So he says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord had made ruler over his household to give him, to give them meat in their what? In due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Service. You can't be on fire for God and not serving God. And when you are serving God, you are serving it with enthusiasm, with passion, with joy, with lots of fervence. You know, he wants to, that thing, that thing is captivating. It, it's, um, it's uh, how do I say it again? Is um, is contagious. When you see somebody that is on fire and you come closer to that person, that fire will rub off on you. Yeah, but if you come in contact with somebody that is cold, you wear a blanket, you cover yourself because that cold is going to affect you. Okay, so what is? Okay, that's another way, yeah. If you subject yourself to leadership, follow them that through faith and patience, obtain the promise. Watch them, because, follow them because they watch over you and all of that. So when, when you are going dry and all of that, they are the ones that are going to tell you. Because that one again, it depends because there are some that you are following. Anything goes. But the way God designed is, is that if you submit, submit to leadership, if you submit to the leadership of the church and all of that, then you should be open. So, if, because you see, when you have, when somebody, when, when somebody is always telling you, well done, well done, it's well, it is well, it is well, it is well, well done, well done, it is well with you, it is well with you, everything, all correct, sir, all correct, ma'am. It doesn't work. But you have somebody that will tell you that this thing that you are doing is wrong. When you do something wrong, when you find yourself in a wrong place or doing something wrong and all of that, you need, it, you need to be talked to. Somebody needs to talk to you about it. So if you are not subject, for example, some people, when they do some things in the church, they, they, dis, they tend to discipline them in the church. Some of them, they will leave the church, find another place. You will never, ever, ever amount to anything before God. So that's very, very, very important. Very important. Leadership. Submit yourself to leadership. See, there is no free head. Everybody is under control. You must be under a control. You mo nobody is a loose, you can't be a loose cannon. There is somebody that you are, must be answerable to in this your life that you are living. Even, even, in, even if you are the president of a country, that's why they don't want military rule because military rule are not subject to anybody and all of that. They make decrees, whatever they like and all of that they do, and you can't question them. But if it is a, if it is a civilian rule or government, the president is... Responsible to who? 
to who? Everybody is subject to the constitution. And the president is answerable to the people. Because it's the people that elected him. That is why he says it is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's about the people. So when the people start talking about what you are doing, they don't want it and all of that. You have to stop. Because they are the one that put you there and you are there for them. So you must be responsible to somebody in this life. You can't just be running your life on your own and read the whole of the Bible. Even Jesus Christ is subject to God. So how much more? And you hear him every time you hear him say, my father, my father, my father. And if somebody is with you and, you know, you don't talk about your father or your leader or somebody authority over you and all of that. You don't refer to that person. You don't refer to such authority and all of that. You're a loose canon. When you are going wrong and all of that, nobody can correct you. And when they try to correct you, you will, you will, you will, you will take offense. And then if you can't contain it, you will leave and then find somewhere else. That's why you have a lot of them. Itinerary ministers. Where do you belong? I don't belong and I'm, I'm on my own. Who are you answerable to? I'm not answerable to anybody. And that's what they are preaching now. Okay. Counting it joy. That is the joy of the Lord. That is what you are talking about. How to be fervent in the spirit in every time. But now, what is going to make you be that fervent? What is going to make you continue to be fervent in the spirit? Now, because some of us have grown cold. Yeah, some of us have grown cold. Because if we look at all the things we are mentioning now, you find out that some of us are not doing it. And if you are doing one, you know, the word of God is this, like this. The word of God is like this. Eh? It's, a, it's a total package. You don't separate one and leave the other. Because he said, the one that says, thou shalt not steal, is the same person that said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So if you commit adultery and you don't steal, you are guilty of what? Stealing. Both adultery and stealing. You have not committed the offense about stealing, but you committed adultery. You are also guilty of stealing. I don't know whether you understand. That's how the word of God is. That's how God is. The commandment, the whatever... The totality of God's word is packaged in one word. And what is that one word? Love. Okay? So, if you love, he said love is kind. Love is patient. Now, if you are patient with somebody and you are not kind, you don't love. Because not, that being unkind is going to destroy that your patience. Is going to rubbish it. Have you ever eaten ground nuts, peanuts? You have it in your hand. Maybe you have like five or six or seven nuts, and then you have one that is bad inside it. Then you throw it inside your mouth. What happens? Eh? But it's only one, no, it's only, uh, you don't understand. I said one nut is bad. There may be like seven or eight that are good. There is only one that is bad there. So you throw them inside your mouth and then you chew it. What happens? The taste will change. It will be sour. You will squeeze your face and then you will spit it out. And it is only one out of how many? You see what the evil does. If you, if you have one that is bad, you chew it, and the thing is bad, mm, you, bring another, you bring another one that is good, put it inside your mouth. Is it going to nullify that one, the bad one? It will still be there. If you put five inside, what will happen? It will still be there. Bad. One leaven. One leaven. Leaven it the whole lump. 
So that is why everything is in its totality. All that we are discussing is, is a total package. It's just like when you want to rent a house. They say this is a total package. What is the total package? This is the rent. This is the money for the rent. This is money for the agency. This one is for caution fee. This one is for legal fee. Then you put all of them together. That is the total package. You are not going to pay legal fee and then without paying the caution fee and uh, the rent. You won't pay. You have to pay all of them. That's how the word of God is. You can't pick one in isolation. That's why making heaven. <laughs> going to heaven. You must be whole and complete. Amen. Let me ask somebody that I have not said. Okay, King. The fear of God is the beginning. Actually, that is where it starts. If you don't have God's fear, if you don't nurse, nurse the fear of God, if you don't have the fear of God, you will throw cautions into the air. You won't even pray. You won't fast. You won't do anything. You will just be everything. You will be careless about everything. And the fear of God is in your heart. It's one of the spirit of God that you have received. The spirit of the fear of God is inside of you. The reason why we sin against God is because we don't fear God. If you fear God, you will not sin. Some of, some of, some of you don't understand what is the fear of God. I will teach you the fear of When you go home, eh? hello, hello, don't do it here in the church. When you go home, you go to your socket, the socket where you plug fan. Eh? Don't do it here. When you go home, I want to teach you, show you what the fear of God is. So when you bring that socket, you take... Um, You take, you take spoon, then put it, took it inside. Hold that spoon and put it inside. What happens to you is a, that, that thing that will happen to you is a fear of God. What I'm telling you, I did it, I tried it so many years ago. I, I asked myself, I said, what is about, what is this? Because I, I've been hearing about electricity, blah, blah, blah. And some of you have never touched naked wire. And you don't know, you don't know the feeling. So I tried it, but not here. So what I did was I went to this switch. The wire that, um, the radio wire. So I plug it like this. I pulled it. I now saw the metal aspect of it. I now say, let me see how it is like. I put my hand inside there. Since that day. Till today, I fear, I know the, I they fear electricity like I they fear God. It is that fear of that electricity. Before you do anything, you make sure that that wire is covered, it has rubber. Before you don't handle it anyhow, you watch first before you touch it. If you touch it by accident and the thing is exposed, what it will do to you is a near-death experience. That's what the fear, that's the best way we can describe the fear of God. A lot of us don't have it. If you have the fear of God, it controls everything that, even the way, even when you come to church, even, you know God is in a place. In Isaiah 8, he said, let Isaiah, is it Isaiah 8? 15 or 15, 8, where you say, let God be your dread. Let him be your fear and your dread. Dread God. Fear God. Tremble at his word. You'll be safe. He says, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your what? Fear. And let him be your dread. Dread God. Fear God. Don't just open your mouth and you don't call the name of the Lord in vain for nothing. Okay, somebody is raising his hand. Okay, 
Yeah, let me hear from uh, Idris. Huh? Yeah. He came late. We mentioned that. Okay. Yeah, that is uh, obedience to God's word. And that is what the fear of God will bring. Fear of God will bring you to obey God. You will fear God, you will tremble at his word. So whatever God has said, you keep it. If God says, take communion, as you break bread and you eat, you do show the lost bread, death still he comes. You keep that command. When God says, love your neighbor, you do it. You obey God. It is the fear of God that drives you to do that. Okay. With the affairs of this world. Yeah, the one, this one is, 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 in, is part of that thing we said about setting your mind on the things that are from above. So when you are heaven conscious, when you are eternally, um, eternity conscious, you lose contact with this world. That's why Paul would say, I have been crucified Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God that loved me. He said, the world have been crucified unto me and I have been crucified to the world. So the world does not have any interest in you, neither do you have any interest in the world. You have detached yourself from this world. So that is the reason why when you go through temptations and all of that, the world is going to sustain you is because of the hope the hope make it not ashamed. That is why he said, in the time of tribulation, when we go through tribulation and all of that, it's because of that hope. Give me Romans chapter 5, verse 3. He said, and not, so, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Have you seen it? Also knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience. And verse 4, and patience experience and experience what? Hope, have you seen it? And hope make it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. So it is setting your mind on the things that are from above. You are spirit minded. You are spiritually minded and not carnally minded. If you are carnally minded, when there is any little pressure or challenge and all of that, you will compromise. Okay. One more. Having beautiful, that is actually because I have two things that have not been mentioned. I have them here. One of which is that friendship with the world is enmity with God. In 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us about evil communication. What does it do? It corrupts good man. You can be a, you can be on fire for God. Oh, fire, fire, fire. Then you meet those whose spiritual thermometer is minus zero, and then you are boiling at hundred degrees, and then you meet somebody that is zero degrees. What will your temperature be now? Eh? It's not true. You might say 50 degrees and all of that. What is going to be, what is going to happen ultimately is that you are going to go down to that same level with the person. If the person is cold, it will drive you to be cold. You will start coming down from 100 to, 4, to 30 to 40 to 50. I mean, 100 to, to 70 to 60 to 50 to 40, 30, 20, 10, zero. 
That's where he's going to bring you ultimately. That's why you say at the end of the day, the guy is backsliding, he's gone back to the world. One of the reasons is because the people that you are your friends are not spiritually minded. Be not deceived. Evil relationships, communications, bad friends, people who don't talk about God, people whose heart is not set on God, people who don't have devotion towards God, they are your friends. When you sit together, there is nothing you are going to be discussing apart from, you, do you know that the, the latest whatever, that they will be discussing about what to wear, what to drink, and what to paint, and all of that. These carnal and mundane things. So there will not be any space for God at all and all of that. That is it. And it is very key. And some of you have friends here. Friendship is by choice. It is not by force. You choose your friend. And when you are choosing somebody, you choose a friend with a purpose. And you will not choose somebody, you will not befriend somebody that you are more spiritual than. Because it will be drawing and drawing and drawing. And another thing again is that if you don't have, you know we have said this in, if, if Oak House Church is seven years now, we have talked about this in for seven good years. What is it that we've been talking about? You must have somebody that you are pouring into his life. You must find somebody. I mean human being, human being. If you don't do that, there is a level, you see, when you have somebody you are going to be pouring into, you know you are going to be talking to this, you know you are going to share, you know, you know you are going to give. So you are going to make sure that you have something to give. And that will make you to study your Bible, that will make you to pray, that will make you to do a whole lot of things. Knowing that, sorry, knowing that you are going to experience such, you are going to come in contact with such people and you are going to minister to them. But when you don't have anybody that you are ministering to, when you don't have anybody you are talking to, you are pouring into, your, into their lives and all that, you are dry, you are cold, you are not doing anything. You won't study. It's just like me, every time I say, oh my, sometimes I will just sit down and say, what kind of life is this? On Monday, oh, okay, let me start. On Sunday, on Saturday, I will be getting ready for Sunday because I know I'm going to do the school of the spirit and I'm going to preach. I'm going to spend time. I will study. I will wait on God. I will pray. I will do all that. Then I will come on Sunday, I will finish. And then after Sunday, on Monday in the morning, I have some people that I'm going to meet with and share with them again. I have to prepare and get ready and pray. And then after that Saturday, after that Sunday, Monday, then it's only on Tuesday that I have a little, that is if it happens. Then after Tuesday, Wednesday, I have another group. After Wednesday, another one is on Thursday. I have to midweek service. After that, the next one is on Friday. There is prayer meeting. And then after that is on Saturday. There are a group of people I'm going to minister. So you find out that every day, you are, you are always with the Bible. You are praying. You are waiting on God. You are speaking in tongues. You are doing that. But if I don't have anybody that I'm ministering to, I'm doing anything and all of that. Like if you go now, there is one Bible that is there. I don't want to mention the person's name. It has been there for about uh, three weeks now. If you don't know me, don't say it so that it won't be me that said it. I don't know, because I saw the guy yesterday. I don't know whether he has collected the Bible. It's been there for a long time. So what he means is that he's not preaching. He's not sharing it with anybody. And one of the fastest ways for you to grow and develop is through having some people that you are ministering to and all. Because you'll be studying and then they will be asking you questions and you'll be answering them the question. And when they ask you the one you don't know, you have to go back to the Bible and read or ask other person that knows better and all of that so that you can have something to give. So by this you grow. You'll be on fire. You're ministering. 
So the more you give, give and it shall be what? Giving unto you. But if you don't give, it shall not. Life is about cycle. Life is in cycle. You take out oxygen, I mean carbon dioxide. You take in oxygen, you remove carbon dioxide. You take, life is like that. You were once a toddler, born inside your, in your mommy's stomach. Now you are born. You are a baby. And then from there you grow to an adult. You get to a stage where you get to, you, become, you start behaving like a child. Life is in cycle. The world we are living in is in cycle. Everything is about cycle. It's about giving and receiving. You take in, you eat food, you drink water, and then you pass it out, you go to the loo and all of that, you remove it, and you put in another one. Life is in cycle. If you break that cycle, you will die. Finally, there is one that is... Um, Making sure. Uh, that is about relationship, the person you relate with and all of that. Some of us, you're on fire. Then when in the time of marriage, you know, there are people you don't advise. I've said this ever. Till today, you can't advise those people. But we just keep talking. Once you see a man or a woman that is in love, it's over. Forget it. You can't advise the person. So the only advice you will give the person is before he thinks about marriage or before he does that. So you advise the person to be able to make a right choice. Because if you make a wrong choice, that other person is going to drive, drag you down. Just like you see them. A young lady is on fire for God and all of that. When he comes to the area of marriage, he now sees a man. Because maybe he is looking forward to getting married and all of that. He sees a man and then he marries the man, and he, the man promises he is going to be. A, uh, is he born again? Um, yes, he, but he goes to church. He, he prays and he goes to church. That's what they will always say. And then you get married to the person. The woman is on fire, and then after some time, the man will tell you, "Hey, calm down." So he will drag you and drag you down. And that will be the end of it. There are many of them. But if you don't value your spiritual life, if you don't value eternity, you can give out your destiny at will to anybody. And that will be the end. And you won't blame anybody. Then the final thing that I say, I'm going to say is that be quick to repent. When you make any mistake, when you make any mistake, any moment you sin, that second, that minute, repent. Don't go down. Don't allow it to go down with the sun. Be angry and sin not. And let not your anger go down with the sun. If you say something bad to somebody now, if your spirit is alive, hello, hello, if your spirit, if you're on fire, if your spirit is alive, you say something bad to somebody, it will register in your heart. Your heart will say, no, 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 no. Your heart will condemn you. So the best thing to do immediately, you say, Lord, I'm sorry. You take out 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Reflect on that. Feel whatever you want to. Mourn. This thing that I did is bad. Lord, please have mercy. Give me the grace. No. Within 30 seconds and all of that, you cleanse your impossible, you apply the blood. I do it. I cover, I apply the blood of Jesus over me, man. I don't want it to carry, I don't, if I do it now, by, I won't even wait till I get out of the room. I will do it immediately. Repent immediately. Okay. Because of time, we wouldn't be able to do a recap and all of that. But we have understood what we have said. Remember, when we come next week, we're going to re revisit this. I mean, do a recap. Wow. I hope you are all blessed by that wonderful and powerful message. Now, make sure not to log off because our main service will be starting real soon. So make sure to stay tuned and we will be right back.